Before I read the scripture, I want to remind you that this is the first Sunday in Lent, as Pam pointed out to us. This is a time of sober reflection and self-discipline for us to embrace the experience of Jesus heading up to his crucifixion and death. I'd like you to keep the meaning of Lent in the back of your mind as we explore the scripture. Please join me in hearing the word as I read today's lectionary scripture from the book of Genesis. And uh, let me also mention that um, all of the scriptures that I'll be using today come from the inclusive Bible. God then said to Noah and his family, I hereby establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you and with every living creature that is with you, birds, cattle, and the earth's wildlife, everything that came out of the ark, everything that lives on the earth. I hereby establish my covenant with you. All flesh will never again be swept away by the waters of the flood. Never again will a flood destroy all the earth. God said, Here is the sign of the covenant between me and you and every living creature for ageless generations. I set my bow in the clouds, and it will be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. When I bring, my, when I bring clouds over the earth, my bow will appear in the clouds. Then will I remember the covenant that is between me and you and every kind of living creature. And never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. Whenever my bow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature on the earth. God said to Noah, This is the sign of the everlasting covenant that I have established between me and all living things on the earth. We were watching the Tony Awards a few years ago, and Sarah Jessica Parker was on, and she talked about the love that she and Matthew Broderick have for the theater. We love to go to the theater, she said. We love the stories. We love to hang around and meet the actors. We, we sing the songs around our home. Let's face it, we're theater geeks. Now, Jana and I have to face it, we're worship geeks. Uh, there has never been a time in our married life that we have not been in regular attendance at church. There was even a period three years or so, a, a period of three years or so, that we were attending the 8 o'clock service at one church and the 11 o'clock service at another. Last year, we both took a week of vacation to attend a five-day conference on preaching. It was wonderful, and if you're uh, worship geeks like we are, you might want to consider coming with us this year to Atlanta to the same event in May. One of the first, the first speakers we heard at the conference last year was Thomas Long. Uh, some of you have heard of him or read his books, so you may have even heard him speak. He wrote the standard textbook on preaching that is used in many seminaries. In his lecture at that event, Tom Long talked about the desperate situation that the church finds itself in. He said, any of you who are involved in any way in a congregation, whether you are a pastor, associate pastor, a musician, educator, lay leader, however you're involved in a congregation, my wager is that you are involved in a church in trouble. Whether your congregation is large or small, whether it's growing or declining, whether it's filled with young people and new ideas and energy, or filled with old people and diminishing resources, our boats may look different, and some may be more seaworthy than others. But we are all floating on the same sea of, America, of the American culture's reaction 
to the institutional form of Christianity we call a congregation. And that sea is boiling and churning. Whether we're talking macro or micro, denominational, congregational, whether we're talking, whether we're talking cultural or in the hearts of believers, this is a time of trouble, turmoil, and crisis. The flood story was written down during the time of the Jewish exile. Uh, the exile began about 600 years before Christ and lasted about 40 years. Judah had been conquered by Babylon and leading citizens, royals, uh, military leaders, religious leaders, and artisans were deported to live, to live in Babylon. Psalm 137 was also written during this time and it depicts the feeling of the exiles. A part of Psalm 137 reads, By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered our Zion. On the willows, there we hung up our hearts, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. All that those exiles from Judah had known and loved had been taken from them. Old forms of understanding did not seem to work anymore. Removed from their homeland, even things we might not think about had to change. With a different climate and soil conditions, they probably had to learn new farming methods. Available building materials were probably different. The government was certainly different from what they had known before. But other changes they faced were even far more difficult. Friends and neighbors remained back in Judah. In some cases, beloved family members were left behind. But perhaps most painful of all was leaving Jerusalem itself. They had been forced away from the home of their God and you can hear the ache in their hearts. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. The exile to Babylon was a time of crisis for the people of Judah. And out of this crisis emerges the flood story. Whether it was already part of the oral tradition, or if it was formed during the exile, it doesn't really matter that much. The fact is that this time of crisis is when it was seen as important enough to write down. You can look at the flood story as having three acts. The first act is God's observation of the sinful world. The second is God's decision to destroy the earth, Noah building the ark, and the flood itself. And the third act comes from the lectionary, is, is our lectionary scripture, and that is God's promise. When you walk in to see a play only um, at the, when you walk into a play to see only the third act, you miss a lot of the story, and it can be difficult to understand what it means. So let's go back for a quick summary of the earlier acts to help us make more sense of the third. In the first act, God observes the sinful world. Unfortunately, the first act in the Bible is pretty thin. Um, there is some kind of sexual misconduct, misconduct mentioned, but there is not much source material, and what is available is obscure and hard to translate. If we use the assumption that we are not much different today than people were then, we can come up with a long list of evils that God might have been concerned about. Selfishness and greed, violence towards one another, corruption and lying, 
failing to care for the widow, the orphan, and the stranger, the list can get quite long. Suffice it to say, we can imagine much evil for God to be disgusted at. The second act is God's decision to destroy the earth, Noah building the ark, and the flood. I have to be honest with you, I find this act to be troubling. I simply cannot believe that a loving God would respond to the evil in the world by adding more destruction and chaos. There's plenty of chaos and destruction in the world without God adding to it. But attributing the troubles of our lives to God's action is very common when life is out of control. Nevertheless, the scripture tells us that Noah gathers his family and the animals of the earth onto the ark to weather the storm. This could not have been a pleasant voyage. According to the scripture, the waters rose for 150 days and then took another 150 days to recede before the ark uh, came to rest on Mount Ararat. After that, the voyagers have to wait another couple of months for the land to dry out enough to leave the ark. Now imagine spending a year in close quarters with your entire extended family. You're being tossed around in severe weather. There's no place to go to be by yourself for a while. And you don't know how long you're going to be on board or what the world is going to look like when it's over. On top of all that, you're sharing a space with all those animals, some of whom want to eat each other or you. Imagine the excitement you'd feel when you realize you're going to be able to leave the boat after a year in these conditions. This picture is the kind of thing I remember from childhood, showing everyone getting off the ark into a pristine world that has been washed clean by the floodwaters. Unfortunately, that's not what the world looks like in the aftermath of a flood. Here are some pictures showing you what it was like when the floodwaters of Hurricane Katrina subsided. If you had ridden out a storm for a year and were excited to greet the fresh and clean world, you would be shocked to see the devastation the waters had brought. As bad as things were on the ark, you realize that the hard part is just beginning. It is not clear what it will take to rebuild, but it is clear that rebuilding will be hard work. The, the destruction may be over, but the crisis is not. Noah's family leaving the ark were people in crisis. The people in Babylonian exile were people in crisis. And as Tom Long pointed out, Christianity in the United States is in crisis. He went on in his lecture to spell out some of the specifics of the crisis we face. There have been steep declines in both denominational membership and congregational attendance. Giving is also down, and we find ourselves in conflict about the most basic notions of what it means to be Christian. Political maneuvering and power struggles are common in the church, and there seems to be a diminished vitality of engagement. Act two of our story ends in crisis, even though the floodwaters have subsided. Long also pointed out a positive to this situation. He told about recommending a change to a congregation when he was a young minister. His suggestion was dismissed with the line, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. At least now, he said, everybody knows it's broke. I do not agree with Tom Long that the current state of affairs is God's doing, but I do believe that we are part of the living systems God has created in our world, and that change in these living systems generates crises that God can use for good. As Tom Long put it, something is dying in the American church 
in order that something new and more faithful can be born. Now for Act 3. The action of the third act is all God's. The lectionary reading does not capture all that God has to say in the third act. Just before the lectionary passage, God tells Noah and his family what is expected of them. And this is what it says. God blessed Noah and his family and said to them, Bear fruit and be many and fill the earth. Now, however, all the earth's wildlife and all the birds of the air and all that crawls on the ground or swims in the sea will be afraid of you. But remember that they are your responsibility. They are in your hand. You may now eat anything that moves and lives, just as it had been with the green plants. I now give them all to you. However, you shall not eat flesh with its lifeblood still in it. At the same time, I will demand an accounting from your own lives, your own blood. From every animal I will demand it, and from every member of the human race in regard to one another, I will demand an accounting of human life. If anyone sheds the blood of another, by others will their blood be shed. For in the image of God has the human race been created. Now go, bear fruit and be many, abound on the earth, and increase your numbers. Now God has laid out expectations of humanity. We have been amazingly successful at fulfilling some of these expectations. God has permitted us to eat what we want from the bounty of the earth, and we have certainly taken advantage of that. We have also been successful at becoming many. This chart on the screen here shows the progression of world population growth from Jesus' time until 2000. As you can see, there's a slow and steady increase uh, from about a quarter of a billion people at the time of Jesus, 250 million people at the time of Jesus, until um, uh, just under a billion at 1800. So 1800 years there. And then things take off with the Industrial Revolution, and last year we passed 7 billion. This only goes up to 2,000. But the line goes all the way up to 7 billion now. So from a billion people, shortly after 1800, it took about a hundred years to add our second billion. The next billion takes uh, about 50 years, and then the growth accelerates to the point that we've added 3 billion in just over 10 years. 1800 years to get to the first billion, 50 years to get to the second billion, and then three billion in just over ten years. I hope you will just think about what that kind of growth might mean for you and your children in the years to come. The other thing God says to expect, we haven't taken to heart quite so well. Um, with so much power over the earth, we are accountable for how we live in relationship, not only to each other, but to all life on earth. Earlier this week, I read a blog post for, by a woman who had lived uh, for a time in a, with a remote tribe in Madagascar. When she arrived, she unpacked her belongings, and she had some uh, packing materials and some other trash that she wanted to get rid of. And when she tried to ask the tribe members where she should put her garbage, she had a hard time getting them to understand the question. Finally, she realized the problem was not that she couldn't come up with the right words to explain what she needed. It was that this tribe did not have the concept of garbage in their realm of understanding. They lived with so little that there was literally nothing to throw away. I've been thinking a lot about consumption lately. 
And like every American I know, I am caught in this treadmill of consumption. This table shows some of the changes in consumption from the 1950s to the 1990s. And so you see, uh, at least double in, in all of those, this is per capita, not total consumption. So as the population increased, it, that gets multiplied into this. But so at least double in all of these resources, and uh, in aluminum, seven times the consumption, and in plastic, that's not surprising because plastic took off in the 50s and 60s, four times consumption, five times consumption of plastic over that time. So to get the total change, you'd have to multiply the second number by population growth over the same time period. Now, politicians, economists, and business people worship at the altar of economic growth. When we were watching the story of stuff during the, uh, the potluck last week, it mentioned that after September 11th, the September 11th attacks, the president did not ask us to pray or to sacrifice. He asked us to shop. I do not think that either political party can claim the moral high ground on this. A different president might not have said those exact same words, but a slowdown in economic growth would have been seen as an emergency by every population on the national scene, to, uh, by, I'm sorry, by every politician on the national scene today. I've been reflecting on how we in Community of Christ reconcile our participation in this economic treadmill of growth with the words of Doctrine and Covenants section 147. Repression of unnecessary wants is in harmony with the law of stewardship and becomes my people. You don't have to be an expert in economics or statistics to understand that there's a problem over the long haul with unrestrained economic growth. We live in a planet of certain size with a certain amount of resources and sooner or later there comes a time when the economy becomes bigger than the planet's ability to supply it. In this part of the flood story, God says that we are accountable for our stewardship over the resources of the earth that have been put into our hands. There is also a promise, and this is what's declared in the lectionary reading. God says, when I bring clouds over the earth, my bow will appear in the clouds. Then will I remember the covenant that is between me and you, and every kind of living creature. And never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all flesh. Whenever my bow appears in the clouds, I will see it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature on earth. This is called out as a covenant, but it is different from our common understanding of what a covenant is. We know covenants to be binding on both parties. If party A does one thing, party B promises to do something else. If one party fails to perform as agreed, the other party is free from the covenant and may even have a claim against the one who failed to perform. Even covenants, covenants in the Bible are typically this way. God will bless the people if they follow the law of God. But this covenant from the flood story is different. It is a promise that God makes to Noah's family without any commitment from the other side. God says, The bow will remind me that I will never again destroy the life on earth. God's behavior is constrained but ours is not. When I read this passage, I can't help but think this is the moment that the Hebrew people first began to understand God's loving nature. In the few pages of this story, God moves from being one who's willing to wipe out all of creation to a God who loves creation so much that the creation is safe from God's anger. 
This is the promise that we rest in. It is the basis of our faith in a loving God. For me, it is central to my affirmation that God loves us and cares for us. You might say that the God of the beginning of the story is dead, buried and resurrected in a different form at the end of the story. Of course, this transition does not actually take place in God. I'm convinced that God is loving and compassionate all the way through. The change is in the people. They experienced chaos, then crisis, then new birth. They recognized God in a different way as a result of the experience. As we make our way through the suffering, chaos, and crisis of Lent, let us remember it is through such experiences that we may be reborn in greater likeness of the living Christ.